Satan, Sunday Saint, fooling your neighbor, that's what you think, reading the good book, singing the hymns, come Monday morning and it's back to a life of sin. The Bible says those who practice sexual immorality will not inherit the kingdom of God, but will be cast into eternal fire. What is sexual immorality? It's translated from the Greek word porneia, which means fornication. The Bible uses the word for any kind of sexual desire outside the covenant of marriage between a husband and wife, for whom God designed sex, that they may be one flesh. Since God created sex, He gets to define it, so any kind of sex outside His definition of marriage is immoral and idolatrous. Premarital sex, adultery, homosexuality, porn, and masturbation, since sex is not intended for one person but a husband and wife. Jesus said if a man lusts after a woman, he's committed adultery in his heart. The culture will say sex is okay as long as two people love each other, but causing someone else to sin is not loving. 1 Corinthians 7-2 says because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. When sex is enjoyed between a husband and wife, they protect one another from sinning. In a list of sins, sexual immorality is often at the top. Every other sin is outside the body, but sexual sins are committed against the body. It's self-destruction, desecrating that which was made in God's image. The body is for the Lord, and for those united with Christ, sexual immorality dishonors that union, defiles the temple of the Holy Spirit, and is likened to sleeping with prostitutes. Hebrews 13.4 says God will judge the sexually immoral. Ephesians 5.3 says that sexual immorality must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints, when we understand the text. In a heartbeat is a new pro-gay animated short film that's, quote, absolutely breaking the internet, and it's so necessary in today's climate of intolerance and hate, end of quote. It's about a cute little boy who falls in love with a male friend. It's well produced and will no doubt sway the hearts of many to the cause of homosexuality, because most of us are convinced that love is the most important thing in life. When I invited a pro-gay friend to the premiere of a movie we produced on the subject of homosexuality, this is what he said in his review. Audacity is entertaining and has some great comedy and dramatic tension. Unlike most Christian films, it is far from cheesy and has a great well-acted script. Most of all, it's not heavy-handed showing the Christian position on homosexuality without being intimidating or angry. Well done, Michael S. Martin. The Christian response to homosexuality should be one of love and kindness, but it should also inform this world that there's something even more important than love. It's something that is so important our very lives depend upon it. Find out what it is by watching Audacity. It's free viewing and it's been seen by more than 700,000 people. I don't want to offend you, but I have a sister who's gay. And you don't know the struggle she's been through from people who are telling her that she's going to go to hell for what? Loving someone? And where are these two going to go if I pull the trigger? How come the word homosexuality hasn't been in the Bible until a few decades ago? And if homosexuality is such an abomination, then why is the word abomination used to describe eating shellfish? And if God is love, then why is there Does that make sense? It does. I have a question for you. Can you tell that I'm a lesbian? Watch Audacity and her other award-winning movies that have been seen by millions at fullyfreefilms.com. 
Jesus never said anything condemning homosexuality, so that must mean it's okay, right? Well, based on that argument, you could also say Jesus never condoned it either, so that must mean it's wrong. There's actually a lot of things Jesus didn't say, but on the subject of marriage, he said everything he needed to say in Matthew 19. It's there he reiterates God's design for marriage. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. And there you go, in three sentences, Jesus has just given the definition of marriage, which he created, by the way, and anything contrary to that definition is sin, including adultery, divorce, polygamy, pedophilia, and homosexuality. A few verses later, he says that those who are not capable of keeping with this design for marriage should not get married. And he addresses sexual sins in other places like Matthew 15, 19, where he says that all sexual immorality is evil. Something else worth noting here, whatever is written in red letters is no more important than what appears in the Bible in black and white. After all, 2 Timothy 3.16 describes all scripture as being from God. And in John 16.12-13, Jesus said to his disciples, more teaching was coming through the Holy Spirit, who is God, just as Christ is. So passages such as Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, and 1 Timothy 1, which condemn homosexuality as sin, are also the words of Christ. The Old Testament, the Gospels, and the Epistles are all God's word. It's imperative to receive the Bible this way when we understand the text. Moving on in a very moving tale, and against all odds, a former BDS activist who studied at Yale University has fallen in love with an Israeli soldier. And what's possibly more surprising is that their relationship started as a virtual one on Tumblr over their shared duration for the band One Direction. Al TV's Doriel Mizrahi is here to tell us all about it. Doriel, thank you so much for coming into the studio Hi. today. Okay, so this story, as you see, is like crazy and beautiful and all the things in between. And basically, these two girls just met on the internet, and she was just was a BDS activist, and Ronnie was here in the army. And during Tsuke time, they spoke frequently. Tsuke time, the 2014 Gaza war. Right, they spoke frequently, and they they had a relationship. And she sent a picture. Ronnie sent a picture of her mother in a bomb shelter, and then that just really hit Jess, and she was like, you know what, I really understand also the Israeli side as well, and she started questioning her BDS anti-Israel views. Well, that's kind of it, you know, that, that, that kind of goes to the crux of the, of the issue there, the core of the problem with BDS in the first place is that uh, it doesn't really allow you to, to get to know the other side or to form any sort of, uh, you know, communication. Not only that, but I also think the media has a lot to do with this. Like, it's so easy for them to show one side and how the Palestinians in Gaza, you, you see them and, and really my heart goes out to them as well, but they don't show the full picture because I feel like Israel has a very moral army that sees their people, the Gazans as well, and they really want to help them. And it's really like uh, when Hamas, a terrorist group, rules there, it doesn't make it easy for the world to see that and automatically points fingers at Israel. Well, that's, yeah, and that also kind of goes to that argument of the equivalence and the exchange and, you know, the, the size of the army and the power of the army. You know, it's a common argument saying that Israel is, you know, this big, bad army with all this Occupation. advanced weaponry. Right. Exactly. So they're automatically the aggressor when really they're defending southern communities. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you see it everywhere. So even back to the story, when Jess was in Yale, during Tsukaitan, a few days after Roni sent her this picture, there was a pro, like, Gazan, pro, pro BDS, BDS, like, sure. um, a thing. And, and then she was like, you know what, I don't know if I can participate in this because my heart also goes out to the other side. And, and really that's where she started thinking about coming oh. to Israel. And so, okay, so now she came to Israel, I understand. What happens next? Okay, so this is a crazy, like, it gets even crazier. She <laughs> comes to Israel two years ago. She changes her name. This, is, af this is after, like, fighting internally about am I pro- Pro BDS yeah, or not? Yeah, exactly. Like she falls in love with Roni. They have this long distance relationship. She decides she wants to come to Israel with Masa. She changes her name to Mayan, converts to Judaism, is now a Masa counselor. Mm. And like her life Incredible. turned around in 180 degrees. And, and it just shows that like love can happen under any circumstance with whomever you can, as long as your heart is open to listen yeah. and, and make the effort. And what, and what about Roni? Because you mentioned Mayan is working with Masana. Okay, so Roni, she's a director, and she actually produced oh, the wow. first lesbian show in Israel called The Supreme Lesbian. I actually saw it last night. It's so witty. <laughs> it's such a great approach. It shows about, like, what lesbians, 
what their conflictions are and how like how to approach that and see like a bit of their pers perspective in a very funny and great way. All right. Well, really... I, well, I love the love story. I love Me it's too. very touching. <laughs> it's and it's and it's really personal and it's really you know it's really identifiable. You can really empathize with with this. And, and what and is so identifiable? I, I just want to add is that they're so different. Like even now, they said in their interview that they did together, they're like. She Jess wants to raise the kids religious. I don't. Um, I want to move to New York. Jess is in Israel, but somehow we're going to make this work. Like, Roni even they asked her, like, where do you see yourself after the wedding? She was like, we're in New York. Jess is a rabbi. I'm a director. <laughs> and we're like the best lesbian power couple. So it's, I'm sure, you know, with kids and marriage and stuff, they'll figure it out because they've been through so much together. But it's just really beautiful to see. Well. Well, a story good, like this. Well, good luck to them then luck. Uh, in New York uh, <laughs> as, as the power couple they were born to be. And uh, Doriel, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Aaron. First Corinthians 6, 9 says that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, or swindlers will get to heaven. Many critics claim that passages like this one in 1 Timothy 1, 10, which label homosexuality as sin, are poorly translated. They say the Greek word that appears there, arsenokoite, isn't actually a word at all. In fact, there is no Greek word for homosexual. But in understanding the text, it becomes evident that by inventing the word arsenokoite, the Apostle Paul is calling to attention commands from Leviticus, which condemn a man, arseno, from lying with, koite, another man, arseno, as one would lay with a woman. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the words arseno and koite lay next to one another. Uh, no pun intended. So arsenokoite is the joining of two words to make one new one. The Bible strictly forbids homoerotic behavior. Yet a number of churches have come forward to approve such practices, believing that it's unloving not to. But do not be deceived, Christian. To encourage someone in sin that the Bible says will keep them from eternal life is not loving. You should know the Bible also says that those who approve of such behaviors are just as guilty as those who practice them. James 5.19 says if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, he will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. We all once lived out the passions of the flesh, but we're washed when we repent and believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ when we understand the text. One. He mentioned in, in his article, Jason, that, that he is a Christian as well. So what's your take on that? Personally, I, I don't believe that you can live an openly homosexual lifestyle or an openly pre, like premarital sex between heterosexuals. If you're openly living that type of lifestyle, then the Bible says you know them by their fruits. It says that, you know, that's a sin. And if you're openly living in unrepentant sin, whatever it may be, not just homosexuality, adultery, fornication, premarital sex between heterosexuals, whatever it may be, I believe that's walking in open rebellion to God and to Jesus Christ. So I would not characterize that person as a Christian because I don't think the Bible would characterize him as a Christian. LZ, your response? Well, my response is, is that faith, just like love, just like marriage, is personal. And that if you try to use a broad brush to paint everyone's faith, what you really are painting is a world in which is comfortable for you and not a world in which in this country we're allowed various forms of religion. And just because someone doesn't agree with one person's interpretation of the Bible versus the other doesn't mean that they have the exclusive rights to dictate what that person, how that person should live. I would love not to have premarital sex, but in this country, I'm not allowed to get married. Today's question is, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Is homosexuality a sin? In this video, I'll answer that question from a biblical perspective. And afterwards, as always, I'll share some helpful resources. So stick around until the end. In some people's minds, being homosexual is as much outside one's control as the color of your skin or your height. On the other hand, the Bible clearly and consistently declares that homosexual activity is a sin. This disconnect leads to much controversy, debate, and even hostility. When examining what the Bible says about homosexuality, it is important to distinguish between homosexual behavior and homosexual inclinations or attractions. It is the difference between act of sin and the passive condition of being tempted. Homosexual behavior is sinful, but the Bible never says it is a sin to be tempted. 
Simply stated, a struggle with temptation may lead to sin, but the struggle itself is not a sin. Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 teaches that homosexuality is a result of denying and disobeying God. When people continue in sin and unbelief, God gives them over to even more wicked and deprived sin to show them the futility and hopelessness of a life apart from God. One of the fruits of rebellion against God is homosexuality. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 proclaims that those who practice homosexuality and therefore transgress God's created order are not saved. A person may be born with a greater susceptibility to homosexuality, just as some people are born with a tendency to violence and other sins. That does not excuse the person's choosing to sin by giving in to sinful desires. Just because a person is born with a greater susceptibility to fits of rage, that doesn't make it right for him to give in to those desires at every provocation. The same is true with the susceptibility to homosexuality. No matter our proclivities or attractions, we cannot continue to define ourselves by the very sins that crucified Jesus, and at the same time assume we are right with God. Paul lists many of the sins that the Corinthians once practiced. Homosexuality is on the list. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, he reminds them, That is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, some of the Corinthians, before they were saved, lived homosexual lifestyles, but no sin is too great for the cleansing power of Jesus. Once cleansed, we are no longer defined by our sin. The problem with homosexual attraction is that it's an attraction to something God has forbidden and any desire for something sinful ultimately has its roots in sin. The pervasive nature of sin causes us to see the world and our own actions through a warped perspective. Our thoughts, desires, and dispositions are all affected. So homosexual attraction does not always result in active, willful sin. There may not be a conscious choice to sin, but it springs from the sinful nature. Same-sex attraction is always, on some basic level, an expression of the fallen nature. As sinful human beings, living in a sinful world, we are beset with weaknesses, temptations, and inducements to sin. Our world is filled with lures and entrapments, including the enticement to practice homosexuality. The temptation to engage in homosexual behavior is very real to many. Those who struggle with homosexual attraction often report suffering through years of wishing things were different. People may not always be able to control how or what they feel, but they can control what they do with those feelings. We all have the responsibility to resist temptation. We all must be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We all must walk by the Spirit so as not to gratify the desires of the flesh. Finally, the Bible does not describe homosexuality as a greater sin than any other. All sin is offensive to God. Without Christ, we are lost, whatever type of sin has entangled us. According to the Bible, God's forgiveness is available to the homosexual, just as it is to the adulterer, idol worshiper, murderer, and thief. God promises the strength for victory over sin, including homosexuality, to all those who believe in Jesus Christ for their salvation. No, it, on the face of it, it looks like that because, of course, we've always refused uh, a double-bedded accommodation to unmarried heterosexual couples. Why do you do couples. that, though? Why, why you know, It's you... Bible-based. It's, it's entirely Bible-based. But, but, you know, as a Christian, uh, surely the God that you worship is a loving God, is a tolerant God. Um, and if, a civil, if people are in a civil partnership, they're obviously in love. So what's wrong with them sharing a bed? I think it's a myth to believe that entirely. Yeah. It's, uh, he's, he is a loving God, that's true. He's a forgiving mm -hmm. God, mm -hmm. but there is... And a tolerant one. He is a long-suffering God. He's not entirely tolerant mm -hmm. because the Bible is full of cases when he does finally bring judgment about. And we felt that we wanted to, as far as possible, live according to his instructions. And the Bible's very clear about it's marriage. 2013. It's yeah. 2013. God hasn't changed. God, <laughs> Jesus says he's the same yesterday, today and forever. He hasn't changed. The Bible hasn't changed. And we're wrong. We're, we're living in a dream. If we think that he's changed his laws to suit us because that's not the case at all.
Matthew Vines is the founder of the Reformation Project, which has nothing to do with the Protestant Reformation. It's an attempt to reform church teaching on sexual orientation and gender identity. Vines authored a book entitled God and the Gay Christian, in which he attempts to argue that God is actually for homosexuality. In his reinvention of the text, he says that Sodom and Gomorrah were not destroyed because of same-sex fornication. The men of Sodom wanted to have sex with the two angels who came to rescue Lot from the wrath of God, but this was a threatened gang rape. Vines says the real reason Sodom was destroyed is given in Ezekiel 1649. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. So even though Vines acknowledges the Sodomites wanted to rape visitors, he still insists Sodom was destroyed because they didn't invite the angels to dinner. Ezekiel 16 is one of the most shocking chapters of scripture with its use of sexually explicit language. Jerusalem was unfaithful to God who labeled the city a promiscuous whore. In addition to being prideful and uncharitable, God said Jerusalem was guilty of all Sodom's abominations, having at one point employed male prostitutes. So that passage really doesn't work in Vine's favor. He also ignores other passages, like in Jeremiah and Jude, that mention the sexual and unnatural desire of the infamous Sodomites. According to the Bible, homosexuality is a serious sin worthy of the wrath of God, but it's not an unforgivable sin. Those who repent are washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God, when we understand the text. Today's question is, what was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? In this video, I'll answer that question from a biblical perspective. And afterwards, as always, I'll share some helpful resources. So stick around until the end. The biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah is recorded in Genesis chapters 18 and 19. Genesis chapter 18 records the Lord and two angels coming to speak with Abraham. The Lord informed Abraham that the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous, Genesis 18 verse 20. Verses 22 through 33 record Abraham pleading with the Lord to have mercy on Sodom and Gomorrah because Abraham's nephew Lot and his family lived in Sodom. Genesis chapter 19 records the two angels disguised as human men visiting Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot met the angels in the city square and urged them to stay at his house. The angels agreed. The Bible then informs us, before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Genesis chapter 19 verses 4 through 5. The angels then proceeded to blind all the men of Sodom and Gomorrah and urged Lot and his family to flee from the cities to escape the wrath that God was about to deliver. Lot and his family fled the city, and then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities. Genesis chapter 19, verse 24. In light of the passage, the most common response to the question, what was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, is that it was homosexuality. That is how the term sodomy came to be used to refer to anal sex between two men, whether consensual or forced. Clearly, homosexuality was part of why God destroyed the two cities. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to perform homosexual gang rape on the two angels, who were disguised as men. At the same time, it is not biblical to say that homosexuality was the exclusive reason why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were definitely not exclusive in terms of the sin in which they indulged. Ezekiel chapter 16 verses 49 through 50 declares, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. The Hebrew word translated detestable refers to something that is morally disgusting, and it is the exact same word used in Leviticus chapter 18 verse 22 that refers to homosexuality as an abomination. Similarly, Jude 7 declares, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. So again, while homosexuality was not the only sin in which the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah indulged, it does appear to be the primary reason for the destruction of the cities. Those who attempt to explain away the biblical condemnations of homosexuality claim that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was inhospitality. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah were certainly being inhospitable. There is probably nothing more inhospitable than homosexual gang rape. But to say God completely destroyed two cities and all their inhabitants for being inhospitable clearly misses the point. 
While Sodom and Gomorrah were guilty of many other horrendous sins, homosexuality was the reason God poured fiery sulfur on the cities, completely destroying them and all of their inhabitants. To this day, the area where Sodom and Gomorrah were located remains a desolate wasteland. Sodom and Gomorrah serve as a powerful example of how God feels about sin in general and homosexuality specifically. So Jack Phillips of Masterpiece Cake Shop is just getting destroyed by the state of Colorado. It's disgusting. So there's some vindictive piece of garbage human who's decided they're going to go into this Christian baker shop and they're going to ask him to bake every offensive cake they can think of. So they've already asked him to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding and he said, no, I can't do that because I'm a Christian. And then they sued him and he lost hundreds of thousands of dollars and then it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court sort of said, well, he gets to bake whatever cake that he wants. It's artistic expression. But the, the ruling was very narrow. So now they want to drag him back into court because what they want to say is that he's still discriminating. What the, Supreme Court, what the Supreme Court said in the first case is that he's not allowed to discriminate, but the state of Colorado also can't be discriminatory in how it applies the rules. And obviously they had animus for this particular guy. So what the people who are going after Jack Phillips now want to do is allow the, the state of Colorado to show no animus, but punish Jack Phillips. So now they're doing the same thing. The, the same jerks are coming back to Jack Phillips Bakery. And now they're asking him to bake a gender identity transition cake. He's, in, he's a religious Christian. And he says, no, I won't do that. So now the state of Colorado is cracking down again, on him again. This is, honestly, this is a fascist mindset. You got to make people do what they don't want to do or they're bad people. And this is the local news reporting on it. Colorado baker who won a victory in the Supreme Court when he refused to bake a cake for a gay couple on religious grounds has a new legal battle on his hands. The Colorado Civil Rights Commission recently ruled that Jack Phillips had discriminated against a transgender woman. They say Phillips refused to bake a cake for the woman who wanted one with blue frosting and a pink interior. The wow. commission has made it clear that it is intent on punishing Jack Phillips. Other cake artists are allowed to decline messages that they don't want to communicate. But when Mr. Phillips does it, they come after him. OK, so Phillips the problem here is, is not a double standard. So I know that the lawyers are making the case that it's a double standard because that's how the Supreme Court ruled. The real problem here is no baker should be forced to bake any cake they don't want to bake for any purpose. OK, that's what freedom is called. I don't believe the federal government or the state government should be forcing people to engage in business with people they don't want to engage in business with. I know that's a controversial position because people say, OK, what about racists who don't want to serve black people? Or what about anti-Semites who don't want to serve Jews? And my answer is go to a different bakery then. Those people's businesses will fail because people will rightly say, I don't want to shop at a cake shop that won't serve black people or won't serve gay people or won't serve Jewish people. Okay, this is where the free market comes in. Freedom of choice involves allowing people to choose to do things you don't like. And if you don't believe that, then you might want to re-examine your assumptions about how wonderful you are as a human. Because if somebody could come along and try to force you to do something that you don't like, the sword cuts both ways. What? If Jesus had been a baker instead of a carpenter, would Jesus bake a cake for a gay wedding? Of course not. In Matthew 19, 4 through 6, Jesus said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. If a man and another man have romantic feelings for one another, that's lust and a perversion of God's design. If they decide to marry each other and stage a wedding, what they're doing is playing dress up and pretending to have something only meant for a man and his wife. If you want to argue that Jesus would bake a wedding cake for them, you're saying Jesus would go along with this charade that a gay wedding can even be a thing, let alone a God-honoring thing, and Jesus would contradict himself. Do you understand that when Jesus referenced the creation story in Genesis to explain how God made marriage, he was explaining how he made marriage? Jesus created marriage and sex for marriage. Jesus was there at Sodom and Gomorrah when God rained down fire and brimstone for their sexual perversion. Jesus will cast the sexually immoral into the lake of fire at the last judgment. Jesus would never encourage a person to do something he has promised he will judge with fire. He laid down his life so people would repent from sin such as this, so they would have forgiveness and then go and sin no more when we understand the text. I would tell my children as, as I, I tell them what I believe myself and uh, dealing with these social issues, whether it's uh, abortion what, or gay what, marriage. What do you believe? I believe that marriage was defined uh, by God a long time ago. It, marriage is almost as old as dirt and it was defined in the garden mm -hmm. between Adam and Eve, one man, one woman, for life, uh, till death do you part. So 
I would never attempt to try to redefine marriage, and I don't think anyone else should either. So do I support uh, the idea of gay marriage? No, I don't. Do you think homosexuality is a sin? I think that it's, uh, it's, 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 it's unnatural. I think that it's, it's, it's detrimental and uh, ultimately destructive to so many uh, of the foundations of civilization. So what do you do if one of your six kids says, Dad, bad news, I'm gay? I'd sit down and I'd have a heart-to-heart with them, just like you would with your kids. I, I'd talk yeah, if, to I them about, that, if one of my sons said that, I'd say, that's great, son, as long as you're happy. What would you say? Well, I wouldn't say that's great, son, as long as you're happy. I'm going to say, uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of issues that we need to wrestle through in our life, and just because you feel one way doesn't mean we should act on everything that we feel. But it's and yet, not only some on. people would say that telling kids that being gay is a sin or getting married is a sin or whatever, that in itself is incredibly destructive and damaging in a country where seven states now have legalized it. Yes, but... But you have to also understand that, that you are, yourself are using a standard of morality to say that telling people such and such a, of, a, of a behavior is sinful. Um, uh, you, you're using a standard of morality to make that statement and say that that is terribly destructive. So everyone is going to have a standard against no, no, which no, no, they... No, no, listen, listen, I'm not an American. Major. I'm making the point that seven states in America have now legalized gay marriage. Well... Piers, you're, you're, you're speaking to a man who is a Christian, and I believe that all of us are sinful. Uh, I, 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 would st- I could stand at the top of the list and say that I need a Savior, and I need an overhaul of the heart more than anyone. And so that's what I teach my kids. I teach them the values that I hold dear. I treasure the God that loves me and, and forgives me of my sin. And I would teach that to my children, uh, as well as having a wonderful relationship with them that my wife and I work on every single day. So... Your value system, my value system, we're all going to pick a standard against which we, we judge more, uh, behavior morally. All of our laws, ultimately at their core, are going to be based on a moral um, uh, evaluation. In a recent interview, Grammy and Dove Award winner Lauren Daigle was asked her opinion about homosexuality. Do you feel that homosexuality is a sin? You know, I, I can't honestly answer on that. I have too many people that I love that they are homosexual. I don't know. I can't say one way or the other. I'm not God. So when people ask questions like that, that's what my go-to is. I just say read the Bible and find out for yourself. And when you find out, let me know because I'm learning too. Okay, Lauren. Well, in Matthew 19, Jesus said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Leviticus 20.13 says that if a man lies with a man as with a woman, they've committed an abomination. The Apostle Paul refers to this in 1 Corinthians 6 when he says that men who practice homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation 22.15 says among those who are outside the kingdom are the dogs, a word used in Deuteronomy to describe homosexual men. Romans 1, 26 through 27 says that those whose hearts are darkened exchange natural relations for those contrary to nature. Women burn with passion for women and men commit shameless acts with men. If you care for your homosexual friends, the loving thing to do would be to tell them to repent and follow Jesus. Don't be flippant about behavior God has promised he will judge when we understand the text. Question, what does it mean to be a born-again Christian? In this video, I'll answer that question from a biblical perspective. And afterwards, I'll point you to some helpful resources. So stick around to the end. The classic passage from the Bible that answers this question is from John 3, verse 1 through 21. The Lord Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, a prominent Pharisee and member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jews. Nicodemus had come to Jesus at night with some questions. As Jesus talked with Nicodemus, he said, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born again when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. 
The phrase born again literally means born from above. Nicodemus had a real need. He needed a change of his heart, a spiritual transformation. New birth, being born again, is an act of God whereby eternal life is imparted to the person who believes. John 1, 12 and 13 indicates that being born again also carries the idea of becoming children of God through trust in the name of Jesus Christ. The question logically comes, why does a person need to be born again? The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. To the Romans he wrote, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sinners are spiritually dead. When they receive spiritual life through faith in Christ, the Bible likens it to a rebirth. Only those who are born again have their sins forgiven and have a relationship with God. How does that come to be? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 states, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. When one is saved, he or she has been born again, spiritually renewed, and is now a child of God by right of new birth. Trusting in Jesus Christ, the one who paid the penalty of sin when he died on the cross, is the means to be born again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. If you have never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, will you consider the prompting of the Holy Spirit as He speaks to your heart? You need to be born again. Will you pray the prayer of repentance and become a new creation in Christ today? Yet to all who receive Him, to those who believe in His name, He gave them the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and be born again, here's a sample prayer. Remember, saying this prayer or any other prayer will not save you. It's only trusting in Christ that can save you from sin. This prayer is simply a way to express to God your faith in Him and thank Him for providing for your salvation. God, I know that I have sinned against you and I am deserving of punishment. But Jesus Christ took the punishment that I deserve so that through faith in Him I could be forgiven. I place my trust in you for salvation. Thank you for your wonderful grace and forgiveness, the gift of eternal life. Amen. A Pharisee named Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus replied, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born of water and the Spirit? Some have said that water here represents physical birth, like water of the amniotic sac, and Spirit represents spiritual rebirth. Many Pentecostals teach that being born of water and the Spirit means you need to be baptized to be saved and then speak in tongues to prove you have the Holy Spirit. But that's a lie. Rather, Jesus was teaching what God had said through the prophet Ezekiel. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. And I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Titus 3.5 says that He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That's what it means to be born of water in the Spirit. God cleanses us of our rebellious heart and gives us His Spirit that we would worship and obey Him. We have nothing good to give except that which God gives to us when we understand the text.